When it comes to ship's propellers, have you noticed that some have three blades, some have four, and others might even have five or six? Then we get to ships like the Olympic that were fitted with a four-bladed central propeller with three-bladed props on either side. Of course, that's led to the mystery of the Titanic central propeller. Was it three-bladed or was it four? The ship's plans always had it down as a three-bladed, yet her sister, the Olympic, started life with a four-bladed one, swapped to a three-bladed during a refit in 1912, and then refitted her four-bladed one during another refit sometime before 1919. There are no pictures of Titanic's propellers, and the central one hasn't been found on the wreck, so really, no one knows. But I think it was probably a case of Harland and Wolfe wanting to experiment to find out what was best. Either way, that leads us to the question and the subject of today's video. Why do ships have different numbers of blades on their propellers and what's best? In the early days of mechanical propulsion, ships basically just mechanised the ancient practice of rowing with massive rotating paddles. The thing is, just a casual look tells us that it's rather inefficient. You waste so much power with the paddles breaking the water's surface on entry, spilling water during the first part of the stroke and then lifting water and finally circling back around to start the stroke again. This is why, in April 1845, an early design of screw propeller thrashed the existing paddle design in a famous tug of war between the warships HMS Rattler and HMS Alecto. In an idealised scenario, a screw propeller works by accelerating a cylinder of water backwards which, due to Newton's third law, exerts an equal and opposite force on the ship, pushing it forwards. In its most basic form, you can think of a propeller a little like this Archimedes screw. As it rotates, water is drawn through. Following a single rotation shows us that the water caught by the leading edge will be drawn along this far. Vary the angle of attack and for each rotation, you alter the distance over which that water is drawn. A steeper angle of attack is going to move the water further, so it's going to be harder work to turn the screw and, theoretically, move a ship faster. Of course, we know that a ship's propeller doesn't look like this, but by simply shortening the Archimedes screw, we get what looks like a single-bladed propeller. It still moves water, and we still have the principle of a steeper angle of attack moving the water further. But remember, this is only an idealised scenario. In reality, a steeper angle of attack will also induce a vortex in the water, wasting energy. At its extreme, the water is going to be flung outwards and the ship attached to the propeller isn't going to go anywhere. This is our first compromise. We need a steep angle of attack to generate thrust, but not so steep that too much energy is wasted generating that vortex. So that's great, but what about actually moving a ship? A slowly turning single blade really isn't going to do much. You need to speed it up. But again, there are limitations. The ship's machinery will only be able to tolerate a certain rotational speed before the engines and bearings are overloaded. Not to mention that a single blade is going to wobble quite a lot. And even if you do balance it with counterweights, it's going to generate substantial vibrations as the pressure points pass the hull every rotation. And then we get to the real limitation with high speed props, cavitation. Cavitation is the process where the lower pressure water behind the blades evaporates and creates vapour pockets. Remember, low pressure means evaporation happens at low temperatures, so you drop the pressure low enough and it's going to evaporate at sea temperature. Anyway, that vapour pocket is carried around a bit until it encounters a higher pressure area where it implodes and releases so much energy that it can damage the steel of the propeller. It's a very complex phenomenon, but we can summarise it by saying that a slower rotational speed will reduce cavitation. So, although our single-bladed propeller is very efficient, it's going to reach physical limitations before it can generate enough power to be useful on a ship. You need more blades. More blades mean that there are more leading edges in contact with the water, so the propeller is directly transferring energy to more water particles. It can rotate slower while generating the same thrust as a propeller with fewer blades rotating faster. That slower RPM reduces wear on the mechanical parts and reduces the chance of cavitation. It even reduces the vibrations felt on the ship because the power is spread over more blades, reducing the forces generated by each one. But although more blades sounds great, it does come at a cost. The closer the blades are together, the more they disturb the water for subsequent blades, so the lower the overall efficiency. And as the propeller is going to generate more thrust, it's going to be harder to turn it faster, so its maximum speed is going to be lower. Again, it's a compromise. More blades equals more power at a given RPM, reduced wear on machinery, reduced ship vibrations and less cavitation, but it comes at the cost of reduced efficiency and a slower maximum speed for a given engine power. Coming back to the Titanic mystery and the Olympics changing props, we can suddenly see the logic behind experimenting with different numbers of blades. 
swapping out the middle four-bladed propeller for a three-bladed one could have allowed it to be more efficient and spin at a higher RPM, leading to a slightly higher top speed. They probably then found more vibration at the aft end and maybe even that it took longer to reach the top speed due to less overall grunt from the prop. This will be why, a few years later, Olympic's experimental three-bladed propeller was again switched out to be four-bladed. Even today, propeller theory is an incredibly complicated area of science and the only way we have of determining the best propeller for any given ship is experimentation, albeit we can use computers rather than needing to test out full-size props on ocean liners. Modern ship propellers are now designed bespoke for the ship they're going to be on to be as efficient as possible given the water flow around the ship's hull, the machinery characteristics and the desired operational parameters of the vessel. Usually, three, four or five blades is about right, although there are ships that can have up to nine or 10 and, of course, sailing ships will only have two, simply to reduce resistance while the engine is not in use. Propeller theory really is fascinating and I hope you've enjoyed this quick introduction to the topic. Remember, the director's commentary for this video has just gone live in the community, so members with that perk can go and check it out. For anyone interested in becoming a member, check the description to find out more.